Catholic Martyrs of the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 1939, A Catholic Holocaust by Fray Justo Perez de Urbel. Chapter 12, A Popular Martyr. Now we must talk about another educator. His formed, his extraordinary educational silhouette are unforgettable to us. In strict truth, nobody is forgotten by us. We are concerned here, as we have said, with considering unrecorded, little, or completely unknown martyrs. But in this case, and now that we have begun our investigation of the educators, we cannot avoid mention of Father Poveda. He was born on December 3rd, 1874, in Linares, one of the most industrialized and throbbing towns of Andalusia. His seminary life, which began in October 1889, was an ongoing edification for all his colleagues. In those early years of life and virtue, he felt himself to be a defender of what became for him a continuing obsession, order and hierarchy. There is a very revealing paragraph in his autobiographical notes. At school, they said I was hardworking and obedient. I think devotion was more important to me than to the majority of my contemporaries, and I derived great comfort from pious works. And in my early years, I made notes on spiritual matters and felt a great predilection for order in all things. Predilection for order, says Father Silveiro de Santa Teresa, and especially in a young boy, an Andalus, and the son of so-called Latins to boot, is a sure sign of a model and promising life. On innumerable occasions, Don Pedro Poveda revealed the two fundamental aspects of his spiritual silhouette. One of them we have already mentioned, his love for order. The other, his apostolic zeal. One biographer described it simply, He preached with great evangelical persuasion and always gave his listeners sound, solid doctrine, well directed and adapted to those at whom it was aimed. As he had no other ambition than the curing of souls, he hated exotic oratory, tumbling forth in vibrant color and activity, very well pleased with itself and panting for worldly esteem. Spiritual exercises, the missions to the towns, all such venerable Spanish generation, attracted him more than the wide-ranging sermons, for which a sector of our public has such a crazy, deplorable, and irrepressible passion. And furthermore, it would not be all that difficult for the apostolic priest to win the admiration of these people, as he had more than enough science, elegance of delivery, and oratorical qualities to do so. But this is not the way to win the accolade of apostle, which should be the only, or at least the most desired, by the priest of God. Father Poveda began his ministry by practicing renunciation. The man chosen by the Lord advanced towards his martyrdom. There will be few readers unaware of what Father Poveda meant to the humble dwellers of Guadix. Those open caves in the ground, where the conditions of life and morality were primitive, if not non-existent, were the preferred field of action for the apostle. Those simple folk realized at once that someone loved them passionately. Those illiterate people, albeit with a certain lively natural philosophy, noticed that Don Pedro, regardless of heat or cold, ravines or swamps, left the seminary for Ermita Nueva at eight at night. It was impossible to assemble all the people of the district for catechism classes any earlier. Accompanied by some students, each one with a torch, without which they would have stumbled at any moment, he stayed there with inexhaustible patience, often until midnight, although he had many other delicate and difficult jobs which would well have justified him before God in omitting the extra undertaking. After all, it distracted him from the other activities that one normally expects of priests, even when they are well endowed and at the peak of their fitness. As an expert worker in the evangelical vineyard, his principal activity was with the children, since if they had not been corrupted by anti-religious and anti-clerical influences, 
they offered the most promising field for spiritual endeavor. However much we praise the deep and fruitful imprint that Don Pedro Poveda left in the humble quarters of Guadix, our pen could be but a pale reflection of the enthusiasm and love that flourished in his wake. At times, when ferocious storms created virtual rivers of mud, his students ran to look for him and carried him back to the caves in their arms. One day, worn out by the excessive work, he fell ill. His little urchins prayed with all their strength, To the Virgin of Grace we beseech that Don Pedro Poveda get well soon. And he got well. In all the places he visited, a faithful remembrance remained of the noble labors of that great apostle. Another song of the little urchins was, If you want to go to heaven, go to Ermita Nueva, and there Father Poveda will show you how to get there. But we must leave Guadix. For various reasons, he had to leave there and go to Covadonga. He had hoped to work always in the Andalusian city, but it was not to be. In Covadonga, his apostolic energy was directed towards founding an organization against the virtual atheism that deviously, under the aegis of science and progress, threatened to destroy the people's religion. In practical terms, Don Pedro initiated his offensive against the Institución Libre de Enseñanza. You could not have found in those times a more certain prediction or prophecy. We say this because he uncovered at the first moment the fatal bed from which would arise cruel hours for Spain, in which Catholicism and order so beloved by him would be put to the test. We do not have to show how precisely his prophecy was fulfilled. It was fulfilled not just in a few areas, but in all of them, even in the person of Don Pedro himself. His devotion to Our Lady should not be overlooked. There in Covadanga, under the glorious tuition of the Santina, he vowed to struggle in her name to the limit of his strength. Years passed. The projects of Father Poveda were coming to fruition. There arose the brilliant Institución Teresiana, what sort of place was this institution? What sort of people would work there? Let's listen to the man himself. There is something very special about the Teresiana. Love of the work, continuous and assiduous activity, taking time by the forelock, order in everything, and the putting into practice of these virtues. It is quite alien to the Teresian spirit to daydream about castles in the air rather than getting on with the worthy tasks under our noses in accordance with our vocation and vows. Never make a song and dance about fulfilling your duty. Don't bleat about the effort. The fundamental Teresian cast of mind concerns itself with internal mortification, abnegation, sacrifice. Give all you've got keep nothing back, do it without fanfare, quite naturally, as if it was all effortless and without merit. I know of no Teresian lacking all the above virtues. Thus spoke the Master of Masters, he who taught how one should teach. Think, reader, of the good work done by that man, and how his spirit spread across and took root in the greater part of Spain. The spirit of our foundation is not fear, but fortitude and love, he said. Compromised within this love is that which is due to God, and that which is due to one's neighbor from the Teresians. Fortitude will be our defense and will give us patience. We should ask if the cause of his death were the attempts to instill patience and love. I see those children in the caves of Guadix raising their little arms in support of this grave charge. I don't know how long a man can stand up to the accusation of a child. Let us continue. The dynamic Don Pedro, driven to strengthen his institution and make it flow through the hearts and minds of the people, labors without pause. At last, his foundation is authorized by episcopal authority recognizing the great good it spread throughout all classes. This has often been the case. 
when I hear that in some town there is a teacher who supports the faith in those who have it already, as well as the beginners, who changes the customs of the town for the better, who is helpful to the priest, that is to say, to the church, I look into the matter and they tell me she's a Teresian. We come now to the eternal unfolding of our theme. Don Pedro Poveda is in Madrid. In the Casa Central, the spiritual exercises are about to begin. It is the 17th of July, 1936. The same year as always. The year of disaster. The glorious year of the martyrs. We will decline for the moment the honor of describing the events of a model life. The able and enthusiastic pen of Father Silverio of Santa Teresa, to whom we have referred above, will be able to give a better description of the terrible martyrdom, terrible by any standards, of Don Pedro. He passed long hours in his private oratory praying to God for Spain. On Sunday the 19th, he consumed the communion in the monstrous for fear that the house might be attacked and the communion profaned. His anxiety was intense, but he made no mention of it, nor did he even comment on the events. He continued to celebrate the Mass every day, and when he was advised to hide, as his life was in danger, he replied, And where will I go, sick as I am and without being able to celebrate the Holy Mass? As long as there is one Teresian in peril, I must not abandon her, and if I hide, I will be abandoning her. He had placed himself in the hands of Providence. To those who spoke to him, he replied, We must trust in God. Subject ourselves totally to his will. Two days before his arrest, and believing himself to be alone in his oratory, he said to Jesus, after celebrating the Mass, in a loud voice and in a moving and supplicant manner, My God, I wish to be only yours, all yours, and your will be done. We are in your hands. A Teresian, huddled in a corner, witnessed this moving scene. Acceding to the advice of his brother, albeit very reluctantly, he put on layman's clothes of a very somber cut two days before he was arrested. His health was poor at the time. He ate very little. Since he did not feel well, on the afternoon of the 26th of July, he told his brother Carlos that the next day he would celebrate Mass rather later than usual at 8 o'clock. It was his last Mass. A Teresian who was present at the front of the Casa Central writes, What happened during that Mass? Several times we of the congregation looked at each other. His slow delivery, his tense face, and his whole manner told us that something extraordinary was going on in the priest's mind and heart. If only he could have said what he was feeling. When he gave us the Holy Communion, the expression on his face was more tense than ever, and he always looked rather reserved and withdrawn in any case. After the end of the Mass, he remained alone in the oratory to give thanks. It was just a few minutes to nine when four armed militia appeared in the porch. They were hardly indoors when they started a search, grossly commenting, that they were chasing a priest, a fat rat. Father Poveda went out to meet the militia, and together with them and his brother, went into the street. At the door, he said to the housekeeper and two Teresians, Goodbye, I am going off with these gentlemen. His face looked sweetly melancholy and serene. With his usual smile, he took leave of some neighbors who had gone out into the street to witness his arrest and his path to martyrdom. With his arms held out wide, he perfectly represented our divine Redeemer while he was searched by his captors. Immediately, together with his brother Carlos and the militia, he entered a waiting car. As they started off, they told the driver, To the Calle de la Luna! His brother, who was an eyewitness, tells us what happened next. They took us by car to the Calle de la Luna, to the house that had been taken over by the CNT. Then they took us into various rooms, saying that we were two arrested fascists, but nobody took much notice, merely replying, we'll kill them. 
I sprang to the defense of the two of us, saying that we had done nothing. Eventually, they sent us to the Calle de Piamonte, to the UGT. The same militia took us in the same car. There they took us around various secretariats and tribunals. In all of them, when questioned, my brother replied, I am a minister of the Lord. At the tribunal of Artes Blancas, after various consultations with our militia guards, they phoned the tribunal de menores and said they would like to bring us along. We left with a great deal of commotion on the part of the people there, suffering blows and shoves. We got back into the car, but instead of taking us to the tribunal, they took us to the Calle de la Luna, number seven, where they took us into a bar guarded by two militia. I protested about not being taken to the tribunal de menores, and I offered one of them some pesetas to take us there. Shortly afterwards, they came back with another car and told the father to get in. But when I tried to get in as well, they stopped me, saying that they had decided to take him to the Dirección General de Seguridad, and that I should go there to collect him, as they did not have the authority to free him. I pleaded and supplicated, but they would not move. They separated us roughly and took the car back to Gran Via. As he embraced me, my brother said, Goodbye, Carlos. God wants me as a founder and martyr. You save yourself. Don't be afraid. Nothing will happen to you. And I can confirm today that nothing did happen to me. On our last trip to the car, the father said to his guards, If you don't know me and I have done nothing to you, why are you holding me? They replied, You're a big fish and you've caused a lot of trouble to our lot. You're almost a bishop and very dangerous. All the while they blasphemed, which was what distressed us the most. When the car set off, I followed after it in tears, and without knowing where to go, I went off to the Dirección General de Seguridad. I managed to talk to the assistant director and tell him what had happened. Then he sent some policemen to look for the car. I went off to the Tribunal de Menores and asked the judge, who was a socialist, to get his friends to see if they could find my brother and release him from the people into whose hands he had fallen. Everyone said they would do all they could. The Teresians, for their part, and the judge and I, we all did whatever we could. We spent the whole night at it. The CNT lawyer, whose name was Lucas, and the communist deputy, Pavon, promised to look for him and get him to the tribunal, giving me to understand, from what they told me, that they would take me along at the crack of dawn. At two in the morning, they phoned me. I think it was my dear brother's voice which said, I am well and being well looked after. Immediately the line was cut. I continued to hope very impatiently, afraid for my poor brother, who was ill, alone among cutthroats, and having to endure mortifying words. What would happen to him? At ten in the morning, some Teresians phoned after spending the whole morning looking for him. Eventually, they went to the East Cemetery, where they found his corpse. I left at once, together with some tribunal guards who had always been straightforward with me. On reaching the cemetery, he was there, in a plain casket, with his clothes undamaged. The Teresians were there as well, with another person. There were three bullet holes in my brother's body, one in the chest that had pierced the scapular that he always wore outside his clothes, another in the left temple, and the third in his right breast apparently from a large caliber revolver at short range. The two other wounds looked as if made by a Mauser. We will stop Carlos Poveda's story here. As we have already said, Don Pedro was arrested at about nine in the morning. A Teresian learned afterward that as the car with him in it had started off, the butcher said to the driver, to the Calle de la Luna. Half an hour later, great efforts began to find out where Don Pedro had been taken. Nothing was achieved on that day. Father Silvero takes up the tale. The next day, soon after dawn, I continued my searches. But instead of going to the places where they published lists of the shot or the commissariats where the accused were frequently held, I preferred to go to the Casa de Campo and other places where prisoners were shot. 
from a housemaid, I learned that an uncle of hers had the job of collecting abandoned corpses from the streets and highways, and perhaps he could throw some light on the fate of the founder of the Teresian Institute. Now the Teresian begins to describe the search. We took the housemaid with us to show us where her uncle lived, and we found the good man in the wasteland around the Calle de Hilarion Eslava, caring for a very sick daughter. He besought us, almost on his knees, not to go to the Casa de Campo. There is much evil afoot there, ladies. You may not be able to get away from there. Don't go near that place. And he told us also that he had collected the body of a priest from the Basilica de Atocha, and another that had been left at the Mediodia station, and had taken them to the East Cemetery. We should go there first and inspect the bodies deposited there, as this was where most of them had been taken. We will not go into the journey to the cemetery, or our gloomy foreboding on that occasion. Emma told me that she would go in alone to look at the bodies in the chapel, as she was more used to this sort of thing, and it would cause me less distress. We were conversing thus when she warned me not to look at a group of about fourteen men with a corpse. Instinctively I looked, and let out a cry of grief as I saw with the group the body of someone wearing a scapular of the third order. I took hold of the left side of the body and put my hand over a hole in the back. It was so full of blood at the back that it ran down my arm. It was liquid and still warm. On the right side of our father, where Emma was standing, I think there was a hole behind the ear. We don't have to go on. We have here the testimony of three independent witnesses to the death of a man who spent his life in good works. Again we ask, what did that priest do that they should shoot him? What was it that he did? Today his remains repose in the cemetery of San Lorenzo in Madrid, and the process for his canonization has been initiated. It would be pointless and unnecessary to emphasize why Don Pedro Poveda, founder of the Teresian Institute, gave his life.